this, this is Milo of Kota. And he figured something out which led to him becoming a jacked six-time Olympic wrestling champion over the course of 24 years. And by using just this ox to build immense strength, he was able to beat all of his opponents until he finally lost due to his old age. But in fact, his method from 2600 years ago was so effective that it is still used to this day by the best bodybuilders. So let's put on our training gear and go back in time to learn what exactly he did what made him one of the strongest in the world. On a given day when Milo woke up he had an idea that would lead him to six Olympic victories. He decided to start carrying a small calf around every single day and of course people laughed at his idea at first but over time they soon realized his genius. Because as he carried the young calf every single day it became heavier and heavier. But over time Milo was able to adapt to the weight. His muscles gradually grew stronger because each day they were challenged with slightly more weight than the previous day before. And unfortunately he later died because he tried to test his strength by splitting a recently cut tree with his bare hands but he got stuck and later on got devoured by wolves and according to some sources even lions. And if you apply everything that I'm about to say in this video you're going to get some serious muscle growth. And the best part about it is that it will be some simple concepts that you can apply every single day you hit a gym. You don't have to carry around a calf every single day to make this work. We can take this simple concept from Milo and apply it to the gym. So let's start with what progressive overload actually is. It's basically challenging your body a bit more every single workout by making it slightly harder. Because if you don't, well, why would your body start preparing to lift a full grown ox if you can't even lift a 10 pound dumbbell? So we do this mainly by increasing our volume, so reps times sets times the weight that you're lifting. But as you will see later on, there are also other ways to progressively challenge your muscles and thus progressively overload. Now as for the example of Milo, he increased the weight he used to train himself over time by letting the small calf grow day by day and in the gym we can do this as well, although this is heavily oversimplifying it. We can for example on the bench press add some weight each week, do the same amount of reps and sets and get stronger over time. And because progressive overload is actually the only way that you're going to build muscle, you will have to challenge your body again and again and over time you'll notice that the weights that you're lifting have increased their size just like the ox from the story. Unfortunately there is a bit more to it than just increasing the weight every week. Because if I was able to increase that weight every time I would now be able to lift over 400 pounds, which unfortunately for me is not yet the case. That's because increases in strength don't really form linearly, they more so happen in waves, as Brett Contreras describes it. If you do try to use it in a linear way, you're either going to eventually do something called progressive cheating, so making the exercise easier by using different muscles to get the weight up, or you're going to get stuck at some point because your body isn't as quickly adapting as it used to before. But luckily for us there are a number of different ways that we can fix this. First of all we can start looking at the other training variables we use in a workout and look at their matter of importance. And I will go over which variables you should increase first in chronological order, but that doesn't mean that you should only increase one variable. I'm just going to rank the most important to least important in my opinion, so you know what variables to look at first. Because for example if you increase the weight but you start neglecting your technique because of it you're not looking at the levels of importance that I'm about to show you. So you probably guessed it, the first one will be technique. That's because in the first few weeks of training your body will already start heavily adapting to the stimulus without much need of an increase in weight. According to this one study there are more motor units recruited after 4 weeks of training, meaning that your muscles will start becoming more active during exercise and allowing you to get a greater stimulus for muscle growth. Now I quickly wanted 
wanted to point out that yes, this is just one study as an example, but there are many others on this subject. I did however find another study on technique looking at the increases in strength and a reduced risk of injury. This study is important because they compared recreational lifters versus expert power lifters and even though they referred to the recreationals as novices, we can almost be certain that they were indeed intermediates or even advanced lifters because their mean one rep mix was 101 kilograms and close to no beginners will be able to lift that amount of weight. Now this means that even between intermediates and expert lifters the difference in technique is so significant that they noticed a reduced risk of injury and a much bigger bench. Even though the technique of intermediates is quite good already which means that the difference between them and absolute beginners will even be greater. So this is why your technique should always be your number one priority. Better stimulus for muscle growth and a decreased risk of injury. So first progressively overload by improving your technique. Now after technique we're going to look at the range of motion. This is a highly debatable topic but there is research strongly suggesting that the bigger your range of motion, so the distance that your muscles contract, the better long-term muscle growth. And when we take a look at this systematic review, this does seem to be especially true to lower body musculature and a bit conflicting towards the upper body muscles and this is where I will get a bit more theoretical but I do find that most of the experts in the field tend to agree with this. The main point is this, if you only stick to a certain range of motion you're going to hinder a small portion of muscle fibers to contract allowing only a certain part of the muscle to grow. For example the vestus lateralis is most active during the middle portion of leg extensions and the vestus medialis oblique highest during the lockout phase. So if you only stick to the middle on the short term gains might be greater to the higher stress on one specific muscle but you'll be missing out on hypertrophy in all of the different parts of muscles. So for example on a squat when your technique is relatively good but you can squat to parallel start trying to focus on slightly increasing that range of motion for possibly more muscle growth. You can even start a program where you bench with pins and slowly increase that range of motion as a means of progressive overload but this is more for the advanced lifters but what I just said also applies to other exercises like for example let pull downs try to get the bar to your chest first and and then go to the next step which is the amount of reps. Now after the increase in reps will come the increase in weight just like in our story but why would we want to increase the reps first? Well it's basically because for some exercises it's easier to do just one rep more instead of adding a whole 5 pounds. For example on the lateral raises I'm going to be able to do 11 reps instead of 10 with ease with 25 pounds but if I try to do 10 reps with 30 pounds I might be in some trouble and might even sacrifice technique. So an increase in reps almost always comes first before adding weight so that's why you will always see me use rep ranges in a training program. Let's take the 8 to 12 rep range you for example start with a weight you can do for 8 reps and try to get up to 12 reps by doing a rep or two more each week once you reach those 12 reps you increase the weight and you go back to 8 reps or 10 depending on how easy it is for the exercise now to actually do this in the real world you want to take a notebook or something else with you to note down the weight reps and sets that you did that way you know what weight to pick to challenge yourself over time and this is also one of the most important things that I almost see no one do in the gym. So please start using a notebook. Now after reps and weight come sets and some will disagree with my order here but these are personally the first variables I would change during my training program. I would for example have you start with a low amount of sets so 2-3 to three on the bench press and then over the course of your training program increase that number to 5 sets. In the beginning you simply want to let your body adapt to the stimulus slowly and towards the end of your training program you're going to want to feel like you can't possibly increase any 
any of the variables anymore because you feel too fatigued after a workout. Now why does this variable come after weights and reps? Well, you can't really infinitely increase the amount of sets in your workout. There is definitely a limit to the amount of effective sets you can do in a given training. Now the next things on the ladder can be placed in a bit of a different order of importance because the lines are becoming rather vague. But the next thing we're going to look at is your RPE, or basically how many reps you are from muscular failure. And if you don't know what RPE is, I also made a detailed video about it so you know how to use it effectively. But to quickly summarize it, you don't want to go to failure all the time because of fatigue. So using RPE where you know how many reps you should stay shy from failure is going to be important. And we can increase that number over time so that again at the end of your training program you're going to get closer and closer to failure and at the end even training to failure to still get the benefits from it. And increasing that RPE goes a little hand in hand with increasing the reps because RPE basically means how much reps you could do more before hitting failure on an exercise. But sometimes you don't want to increase the reps because it will accumulate too much fatigue and this might hinder future work. Workouts. And this would mean that you for example will have to focus your workout a bit more on technique because you simply physically can't increase the repetitions without neglecting RPE. Now if you can't increase the reps or weight or improve your technique you can also focus on a good mind-muscle connection. Feeling the muscle contract instead of just lifting the weight up seems to be beneficial for muscle growth. One study found more muscle growth in the biceps when subjects had to focus on feeling the muscle but the same didn't count for legs, probably because it's harder to feel your leg muscles contracting than it is to feel your biceps. Now why do I put this one a bit lower on the list? It's mainly because a couple of studies, but mainly this study found that when you're focusing too much internally, you might lower your force output and thus lift less heavy weight. So focusing externally, meaning you focus on technique and getting the weight up, can be better in some cases. Now when should you focus externally or internally? If your technique doesn't suffer if you focus on the mind-muscle connection, you can probably go for it, unless on the main compound lifts like bench press, squat and deadlift. If your technique does suffer, don't go for it and generally it will be easier and probably better to focus internally with less technique intensive exercises like for example machines and such. And I quickly also wanted to say that if you feel a bad mind-muscle connection with an exercise, it doesn't mean that you have to scrap it right away because you can get plenty of stimulus without having a good mind-muscle connection. But a good training program will include both heavy compound exercises and those where you feel your muscles working. Next up we've got rest times. Now this is the last thing I would actually change unless your muscular endurance really sucks so hard that you're out of breath for over 6 minutes after a light set of squats. There are benefits to shorter rest times, that's for sure. But I personally would rather plan in sets with short rest time than try to lower it over time as a means of progressive overload. And if you want to learn more about rest times, I highly recommend to watch my latest video. But you basically won't get much more hypertrophic stimulus from resting less. And the more advanced you get, the more problems you're going to face when trying to increase multiple of the previous variables. And that's why in the beginning I said that progressive overload is hardly ever a linear process. It's like trying to jump without using a run-up. If you give yourself the time to start making speed and use that momentum to break through plateaus, you're going to be more successful. And I will show you how to build a solid run-up in my next video. But if this strategy fails, you're going to want to look at other things to progressively overload, like drop sets, giant sets, myo reps, slow eccentrics, and so forth. And this is our last step, which is basically looking at the minor details like how long your repetitions take, doing a cheat rep more or even half a rep to do still slightly more work than the previous workout. But this should hardly ever be used unless you're a more advanced lifter. So quickly, here is a recap of what to focus on first and how you should approach each and every single variable. Go over this when designing your training program or even when you're working out. A quick 2 second screenshot can unlock your full muscle building potential. Like the video if you enjoyed the information and make sure to subscribe and I'll see you guys later.